Good evening. It's been a little while, but I, I know my way back down these pews. I know where I'm going. It's good to be here tonight. Good to see everybody. And I can honestly say it's good to see all your smiling faces because everybody is actually smiling. So praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord. And yeah, it was a little rainy this morning on the way out, but we had an excellent service this morning. We had a wonderful missions update this morning from Good News Productions International uh, sharing about the decisions made for Christ as Savior. And uh, I just, uh, it was good to see the church family and then to have a wonderful service on top of that and uh, just to, to see everybody working together as a family. And I'll tell you what, Andy is doing a fantastic job. I've been watching Andy, and I have been watching Tom on YouTube, but we already knew Tom was just great, right? We already knew that. We knew he was great, okay? Well, I'm serious, Tom. Would you quit being so grumpy? And, uh, but uh, but uh, I'll tell you, it has been a pleasure to get to know Andy uh, while I was here and watch him just continue to excel in where God has called him. He's uh, just one among many who's raised his hand and said, Here I am, Lord. Send me. And I, I see God doing wonderful things here at this church, and I don't just say that. Trust me, if I didn't see God doing things, I wouldn't say, I see God doing things, okay? Uh, it's it, just a big encouragement for us to be here tonight. We'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as we talk about origins. Origins, all right? Now, uh, get out your textbooks. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to look at the only textbook that matters here, the living and active Word of God, which tells us what we need to know. Now, we need to continue pursuing knowledge, being aware of what's going on, even in the scientific community. But when it comes to the conversation of origins, where we came from, what really matters, I believe we find everything we need to know right in the Word of God. Amen? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to read verses 20 through 28. And if you have your mobile device, you can follow along. Uh, but you know the drill, okay? If we're going to read the Word of God, we're going to stand out of respect for the reading of the Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to read verses 20 through 28. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, and resurrection of the dead also comes through a man... For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Verse 23, but each in his own order. Christ, the firstfruits, afterward at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom of God, uh, kingdom to God the Father, when he abolishes all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death. For God has put everything under his feet. But when he says everything is put under him, it is obvious that he who puts everything under him is the exception. And when everything is subject to Christ, then the Son himself will also be subject to the one who subjected everything to him, so that God may be all in all. Please remain standing. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word tonight. We have all gathered here not to hear a speaker, not to hear meditations, not to hear songs, but to hear you through these songs and messages and prayers. Heavenly Father, thank you for willing servants, not volunteers, but servants who are willing to serve you in leading us all to worship. Lord, I pray this continues to the end of our time together tonight, that we're led to you in worship to remember our origins together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You may be seated. Well, there's two sets of origins we're going to look at tonight, two sets of beginnings. Where did we come from? First, we're going to look at the origins of creation, and then we're going to look at the origins of the church. First, we're going to look at the origins of creation. And then we'll look at the origins of the church. So zero back in on our passage here tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse 21. For since death came through a man. This verse is very inconvenient. Because what we're told, and what I'm told, and, and what I pick up from the entertainment, from the academics, from the education, is that I have what it takes within me to be a good person. 
That if I'm struggling with something, I need to try just a little bit harder. I need to get my act together. I need to find a new set of friends. Maybe I need to find a new place. Maybe I need to get a new vision. Or I need to go find myself, whatever that means. That's what I'm told to do. I, I'm told... If I'm not finding fulfillment, if I'm not satisfied, it's because I need to do something. I need to find out who I really am. But we're told in verse 21 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, since death came through a man. Now, of course, we're, we're speaking of Adam. Here's an inconvenient truth. This is an inconvenient verse because it tells us, not, not standing alone, but within the rest of the context of Scripture and several passages like it, we're going to be running through here in a minute. This gives us a glimpse into the truth that we were born with a sin nature. In the discussion of origins, we have, to, we have to be able to wrestle with this. Even if you're not comfortable with it, there's going to be a lot of stuff with God we're not going to be comfortable with even as Christians. But we've got to be willing to at least wrestle with this notion that sin came through one man. Death came through one man. Otherwise, we're going to have trouble understanding the purpose of the crucifixion. Why? What's the point? If, if we could really get our act together and we could contemplate God enough and understand Him enough and really just squint our eyes and focus on Him enough, if that was enough and we could just be obedient ourselves... Why did Jesus Christ have to come and die on the cross? We're not going to understand the origin of the church until we understand the origin of creation. God created the world and he said it was what? It was meh. I hear that a lot more. It drives me nuts. It's not a real word. Quit saying meh. It's not a word. No, he said it was good. And then he forced Adam and Eve to disobey him, right? No, 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 no. Oh, here's the free will we like to talk about, the choice. And they made the choice, and they had the free will to choose. And even with the goodness they were surrounded, the paradise they were living in, the perfect world, they had everything they needed. Eve didn't have any competition. Adam didn't have to worry about unemployment. They had everything they needed, ultimate satisfaction, and yet when that temptation came, just a little bit more. You've got everything, but you could be like God. They had everything, and yet they were discontent. Now, church, let me tell you, I, I know in the back of our minds, I am very guilty of this. In the back of our minds, we think, once we get to this point in our walk with God, we will be satisfied. When I make this decision, after I make this commitment, when I follow through with this type of worship, whatever it is, this devotional, personal life, whatever it is you want to call it, we think we will reach a level of satisfaction, but it never arrives on this side of earth, on this side of heaven, and it's not supposed to. Because if we understand our origins, we understand that we were created to worship the Creator and to spend eternity with Him. That is our oranges, origins as humanity. I said oranges. Now, I like oranges, but we're not talking about oranges tonight. And every time you hear me say origins, you're going to hear oranges. So let me tell you about oranges. Every Thanksgiving, when we get together as a family, on my mother's side, my folks were with me here this morning, Dale and Dana Jones, you might have seen them, and they would acknowledge me as their son, so that's a big plus. That's a big plus. At Thanksgiving, we have our family Christmas together. Uh, right now, we're, we're typically meeting down in Oklahoma City area, and we will get a bag. Everybody, every grandkid, every kid, every great-grandkid, everybody gets a sack with just a few treats, and one of those treats is an orange. An orange. Every year since I've been a kid, it's an orange. And it's also explained every year, the reason we get an orange is because when our grandparents were young, Oranges were a huge treat. So by getting oranges, I remember my origins. Huh? How do you like that? It's very simple. But let me ask you, how often do we stop 
And our conversation of where we need to go as the church, and our conversation of what we need to do as a church and reaching out to the community, and our conversations of what we need to do as a family to walk closer with God, how often do we consider our origins? How often do we go back and say, where did we come from and what are we supposed to do? Especially as Christians, this has to be in the context of the church. What are we called to do as the church? And I don't mean center Christian church right now. Right now I'm expanding the camera lens out just a little bit. We're, we're talking about the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ who is being cleansed so that when he comes back, he can take the bride in and to himself. That will be us. We all share the same home address. We all share the same home address and we will forever. So turn with me to Romans chapter 8. We, we need to consider a truth. Because we just read that through one man, Adam, uh, all are now subject to death. Because when he rebelled against God, when Adam and Eve rebelled against God, they brought on the curse of sin, sickness, and death. Congratulations, they hit the jackpot, and we still get the payout to this day. How many of you... Are, sin, are, are just sick of sin in this world? How many of you are sick of sin in your own personal life? How many of you are sick of the sickness reports? How many of you are fed up with the death reports? And, and, I know, and I don't mean fed up as in we don't want to hear them. I know we want to pray for each other. We need to pray for each other. This church is phenomenal at lifting each other up in prayer. Keep that up. But how many are sick of that? I'm sick of that. But look at Romans chapter 8. Here's a little bit of hope. Here's, if you feel alone in this, don't be. This was spoken of way back when, uh, nearly 2,000 years ago, when the Holy Spirit spoke through the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8. Uh, go down to verse 22. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. And not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. When we look at the origin of creation, it starts tying into the origin of the church. And I've discussed this before, and it's been a little while. But when did God develop the plan to establish his bride, the church? When did that start? At the very beginning. The lamb was slain at the foundation of the world. This was, he knew what was going to happen. That doesn't mean he made it happen. He just knew it was going to happen. That's how his sovereignty works. Church, that's the good news. There was a plan. We don't serve a God who throws his hands up and says, they messed it up again. All right, that's what I do. I was, um, we were getting things ready out there in Virginia, and in between snowfalls, we were trying to mow because the grass was still growing in between snowfalls, because in Kansas and Virginia, the seasons can't make up their mind, apparently. I mean, I'm watching, I had mowed, and within about three hours, we started getting snowfall. And I was mowing in short sleeves and fine, and then it just, We've been in the same boat there. God has allowed us to share that blessing. Well, I couldn't get one of the weed eaters to work, so I took it into the little garage there, and I was trying to, I had the engine apart, and Daniel and Rebecca came out and wanted to help. And I was like, all right, quality time, here we go. So I showed them what they could do, and I had Daniel with a, just a little handheld screwdriver taking little nuts and bolts, and I've never really done this. I don't want the kids to touch my stuff when I'm working on it, but I say, hey, we're going to have some good bonding time here, right? Okay. So I let Daniel, Daniel's doing a good job, just loosening nuts on this one weed eater. And I gave Rebecca a, a, a socket and a, a ratchet. And I said, okay, I need you to take off, start, to, I loosened the spark plug in the weed eater. And I said, okay, start loosening that spark plug and pulling it out. And they were doing good. And then I hear Rebecca say, uh-oh. Like, okay, no big deal. And I, I said, that's fine. And she, I said, what's wrong? And she said, oh, I dropped the socket. And I said, oh, okay, well, and I took the tools and I, I set it aside and I said, oh, I'll finish working on this. But I said, did you get the spark plug out? She said, yes. And she handed me the spark plug. I said, all right, good job. And I continued working and I looked and I, I finished what I needed to do with the weed eater. And I was uh, trying to see if I could get uh, a spark on the weed eaters, uh, on the spark plug. So I, I plugged the spark plug back in to the wire, and I reached down to pull the weed eater and start it, and it stopped. And I did it one more, wham! It just wouldn't go. And then I saw it. I saw the socket that had 
fallen, had fallen right into the engine block. <laughs> there was a nice little divot on the top of the piston head by the time I was done and pulled that socket out of the engine block. Although I enjoyed working with the kiddos and have done it again, I've taken that risk several times. I've got to be willing to work at their pace. I had a choice. I could have thrown a fit, and trust me, I have a short fuse. But I didn't. Because they're kids, and they're learning. So let's back up a little bit. Stay here in Romans chapter 8. Stay here in Romans chapter 8. We just read verses 22 and 23. Back up a little bit. If we're going to understand our origins, let's understand who created us. What kind, of, what kind of God are we worshiping here? Back up. Back up to verse 14. Keep backing up. Romans chapter 8. Go back to verse 14. All those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba. Father. Those are our origins. When God created this world, he knew what was going to happen. He had a plan. I knew it was very unlikely. My kids were going to really help me with those weed eaters. I knew very likely what was going to happen. Now, I didn't know exactly Rebecca was going to perfectly drop the socket right into the tiny little weed eater engine block, okay? But I knew something could likely break or get lost. I was taking that risk. God not only knew the risk of what was going to happen when he gave us free will, he knew precisely what we would damage. He knew precisely how we would be affected and broken. He knew the price he would have to pay. And yet, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but should have everlasting life. Those are our origins, church. Those are our origins. That's where we come from. Even with the loving Heavenly Father, if we reject his authority and we reject his call to salvation, if we reject the Holy Spirit's prompting, he still has to punish sin. And if we are containing sin, which we do from birth, if we are containing sin, he must take his wrath out on us. Enter the origins of the church. We talked about the origins of creation. When I was about five years old, I was listening to the radio, 88.3 FM in Wichita, Kansas, the Bible Broadcasting Network. And I listened to Dr. Adrian Rogers preach one of his many fantastic sermons, not that he ever had a bad one that I've heard, and he gave a very clear invitation at the end of his message, as he typically does. But this one was very clear and gave a prayer to pray along with. And I remember praying, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And I turn from my sin. Lord, I know you died on the cross for my sins. And I need you to come into my heart and cleanse me and make me whole. Lord, thank you that I am now yours and filled with your spirit. When I was five years old, I believe that's when I was saved. That is when I became a part of the church. I know this is taking on a little bit more of a serious tone, but there's a lot of questions right now as to what the church actually is. What does it mean to be evangelical? What does it even mean to be Protestant? What does it mean to be Christian? What does it mean, church? You give me some definitions. What does it mean to be Christian? Let's open it up for some, some interaction here. What does it mean? What, what do you believe it means to be a Christian? And what have you heard it means to be a Christian? Born again? That's right. Born again. What? Imitators of Christ. What do you believe it means to be a Christian? Maybe that covers it. Maybe that's enough. Is there anything else you would add to that? What does it mean to be a Christian? Having the Holy Spirit inside you. Sealed. Absolutely. Set apart. Okay, now what have you heard? 
Okay, because this is good. We need to know what we believe. Now, we're going to set that on the bookshelf for a second because that is important and it's beautiful and I agree with what, what you all are sharing. But now let me ask you this. When we say we're Christians, what does it mean to those we're speaking to? Because uh, part of what this church believes that I am pumped up about is uh, that we are called at, at Center Christian Church to save the lost and disciple the saved. So let's talk about the lost perspective for a minute. What does it mean to be a Christian in 2018? Sincere, spiritual, and sincere. Okay, this is what the lost are thinking. As long as you're a sincere person, the sincere people in our community. Any, any other th phrases or, or definitions you've heard associated with Christianity? We're different? Okay, there, there you go. That's right. We're different. You guys are different. They may not know what that means. They just know we're different. Believe, that's right, that's right. Believing in a higher power, even if it's the spaghetti pizza monster. Just believing in a higher power. Hey, don't bow. Have you ever not seen the spaghetti pizza monster? Let me ask you that. Supposed to be good? That's right. Morality behaves. Behaving well. Good old boy. <laughs> good old boys and girls. Don't even get me started on the good old boy and girl club. Good old boy and girl club. As long as you treat your neighbors well, the neighbors that you get along with, and you do good for the community, then the good Lord will take in the good boys and girls. Tolerant. Okay, so let's, let's put that book on the shelf now for a second. And let's look at the origins of the church. Because the term Christianity and even evangelical Christianity and even born-again evangelical Christianity is going all over the place right now because our teachings are becoming so soft. We're not defining what we mean when we speak words. We're leaving it open to interpretation. And God has designed purposes for the phrases and words that he uses. And when we don't use his definition of the word, we're not going to see his power in our church. So let's look again back at our passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's jump back there, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15, sorry, verses uh, 20 through 28. Now I'm going to zero in here on a, a different part of the verse. I'm going to start reading in verse 22. For as in Adam, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, and he abolishes all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he puts all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death, for God has put everything under under his feet, but when it says everything is put under him, it is obvious that he who puts everything under him is the exception. And when everything is subject to Christ, then the Son himself will also be subject to the one who subjected everything to him so that God may be all in all. When you came to know Christ as Savior, maybe you didn't pray what I prayed, but you prayed something similar. Out of the overflow of your heart, out of the overflow of your heart as the Spirit pumped into you conviction and then out of the overflow of your heart you dedicated your life to Jesus Christ. You put your faith in Christ. When you made that decision, you instantly became a part of the winning side of this story. Instantly. Church, if there's one thing that frustrates me right now in 2018, it is a problem that's been around for nearly 40 to 50 years in this country, and that is believing we can behave ourselves into heaven. And you say, Mike, no, that's just the good old boy and girl club. I'm sorry, I see it in many committed Christians who aren't aware that they're doing that and or teaching that. We've got to remember our origins, church. Our origins as individuals is that we are nothing before Jesus Christ. That's, that's where we come from. He loves us, and he gave his only son for us, but when it comes to heaven and eternity, we've got nothing. We can't stand up there and say, Lord, you love me. I say, oh yeah, yeah, I love you. Matter of fact, I sent my only son to die for you, and you rejected him. He even said, there'll be many who are doing works in his name. even speaking on his behalf. They've tipped the scale in their favor on the good old boy club, and the good old girl club, and he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. 
Depart from me. I never knew you. I don't want that for any person sitting here in this church tonight. That's my heart and my ministry that I believe God has called Olivia and I to is to create awareness in the church because I believe we are seeing as many people go to hell from our pews as we are from bar stools. I sincerely believe that because I believe we have put people in the church in a coma by convincing them that they're all right the way they are and that it's the world outside that has a problem and isn't God lucky to have us on our team. And when I look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 20 through 28, I see this picture, this story that death entered through Adam, life entered through Christ and if we remain in Adam, we are automatically dead on arrival but if we are turning our life over to Jesus Christ, through salvation instantaneously we have eternal life Amen. and when we cross the river of death we are crossing the river of death that's not going to take us downstream church I believe that and I know that from the word of God we've got a lot of loved ones waiting on the other side of the shore that we're going to see don't worry about them. They're well. They're whole. They're healed. Why don't we worry about what Christ has tasked us to do? Don't worry about where you're going. Don't worry about where you've been. If you know Jesus Christ, your origins are taken care of and your future is taken care of. Focus on the task today because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring forth. I don't know. I have no idea. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Remember, it's Revelation, not Revelations. Because this day in history, who saw that coming? This day in history, 1945, Hitler is defeated. This day, in 1945, Hitler is defeated. I know we don't teach, I know we don't teach my generation or the coming generations how close we came to losing our freedom in the 1940s. I know we don't teach that. Matter of fact, what we teach right now is how countries like America and Christianity have ruined the world. That's what we, t I'm not exaggerating. This is what I hear it discussed even in church forums and forums at Christian universities. This is discussed. Yeah, I, I know there's, there, are, there are ways we have made mistakes as the church. I know that because we're not perfect. But let me tell you this much. God did a miracle in the 1940s by defeating several dictators. God performed a miracle. And he chose, for whatever reason, he chose the United States of America, among some other nations, to participate in liberating the world from dictatorship. This day in history, Hitler was defeated. I don't know if we understand what we were spared from. We'll never fully know. But for whatever reason, God decided that was not the time to end the world. I think it was his way of saying, this could have been over. This could have been over. The United States was not supposed to win that war either on the European front or in the Pacific front. Especially the European front. It's not about America, church. It's about the kingdom of God. But I wanted to take a moment to give a reality check because those are our origins. We came from... That generation and that time, many of you have experienced that time or, or know those well who walked through those times. And, and we've got to remember our origins and the freedoms that God has given us now. I don't know how long we'll have them, church. But let's remember where we've come from, what he has delivered us from, and thank him for that instead of looking around and saying, well, I guess the world's going to hell in the handbasket. I'm going back inside. I don't want to talk to anybody else. Everybody else is crazy. Yes, I know that. Everybody else is crazy. I don't want to talk to anybody else. How about we be grateful for what we have right now? We have an opportunity. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. 
the amen, the faithful and true witness. Look at this word right here. The originator of God's creation says, I know your works, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. If you want, I could throw in a sound effect there. That's what my inner 12-year-old wants to do. Because you say I'm rich, I've become wealthy and need nothing, and you don't know that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed, and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, and ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see as many as I love, as many as I love, I, I rebuke and discipline. So be committed and repent. Listen, I, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and have dinner with him and he with me. The victor, I will give him the right to sit with me on my throne just as I also won the victory and sat down with my father on his throne. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Now don't get lost on that hot, cold, lukewarm bit because in the way these, uh, these channels of water were designed, there was uh, a hot water which was good and had benefits for being hot and there was another aqueduct that had cold water and had benefits for being cold. It wasn't uh, be hot for the Lord or cold for the Lord. No, we, we messed that up a lot, okay? There are benefits to the different spiritual gifts and different types and temperatures of people. But what would happen is they made these aqueducts too long to the city of Laodicea. So as the water came out in open sunlight and the weather, by the time the hot and cold got there, they were both lukewarm. The point is simply this. If you allow the conviction of the Lord to rest in your heart and sit there and stagnate, you're missing out. When the Lord convicts you, he calls for immediate obedience. That's what he calls for, church. And we are only going to be obedient immediately if we understand our origins. If we're taking our origins for granted. If we believe that God has put Center Christian Church here just to create a place for us to fill the pews. And we don't remember that his son died on the cross for our sins so that we could worship him and bring others to him. This church is going to become stagnant. Now, you know what? I still see things happening in this church. I saw new faces today that weren't here when we left months ago. I see new families here that weren't here when I left a few months ago. I see life in this church. Amen? God's living water is still coursing through this church, so I'm calling you as a church tonight before we close to remember your origins, and by that I mean contemplate your testimony. When did you come to know Christ as Savior? What is your salvation testimony? I'm not asking you to necessarily raise your hand and share it right now. I'm asking you to meditate on that tonight. And as you go to bed and go, okay, what was it like when I came to know Christ as Savior? Maybe it wasn't a lightning bolt experience of chills up and down your spine. Maybe it was. Maybe you did have a, an emotional and physical reaction. There's all kinds of different testimonies. But you need to know this before the end of the day. Do you know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Because if those are your origins, I know those are my origins, and if you together share the same beginning story, the same genesis of knowing Christ as Savior, then God's going to continually bring new faces and new disciples into this church because you're sharing your testimony, and you can't share your testimony if you're not comfortable sharing it because you don't remember it enough. If me asking you that question, when did you come to know Christ as Savior, had you sitting there scratching your head going, I don't really remember how that happened. Use that as a wake-up call for you tonight to get alone with the Lord. Write it down. Meditate on it. Rehearse how you would share that because that is what's going to change the world, church. That's when a, that is what is going to fill up this church. That is what is going to continue to allow this church to be here and changing lives for maybe another hundred some odd years. That's what's going to change it is our origin, our salvation testimony, knowing Christ as Savior. That's what we're here to do. We're here to spread that testimony. Amen? Heavenly Father, thank you for your time with us tonight. We know you're continuing to be with us. Lord, my, my heart, my prayer for this congregation, this family of mine.
is that the Spirit moves in ways which advertises you to the county, which applauds you in front of everyone who's watching this church, which brings attention to you. Lord, you've taken this church and its history, you've taken this specific congregation through some difficult times and through some joyous times. It ebbs and flows, it comes and goes in seasons. And right now, I see the life in this church. I see the blood pumping in this church. And Lord, I want... Out of all of this, I want this church to know its salvation testimony individually, to share that, to see people come to know you as Savior. We thank you for the decisions we saw this morning. Lord, I believe this church is going to continue to see more decisions made and see you glorified because that's what this church wants, to save the lost and disciple the saved. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for saving me, for calling me out from my sins. And not only saving me with that gospel of salvation, but also changing me with that gospel of transformation. And I pray that we see that here continually. In Jesus' name we pray. Our hymn of invitation is number 590.